Right. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Welcome to the session. Latin America broadens its horizons. I just need to do a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, we must all understand that this is on the record, of course. Um, I want to introduce our panelists today. We have the um, president of Brazil, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. We have the president of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, the chairman and chief executive officer of Alcoa USA, Alan Belda, and Jose Miguel Insulza, the secretary general of the Organization of American States, Washington, D.C. Well, there is no doubt, of course, that these are testing times for a new and indeed newly re-elected crop of political leaders. There have been what a dozen or so uh, presidential elections in, in as many months, uh, creating a new political landscape. Notwithstanding the uh, centre-right government in Mexico, there's been, of course, a relative um, electoral shift to the left, best described as mirroring a degree of public dissatisfaction with the social legacy of economic reforms and the political parties associated with them. We will discuss that as the hour moves on. I hope this session will give us um, all a real opportunity to get some real insight from Latin America's leaders here, um, business and governmental spokespeople on the region's economic, uh, um, political and um, policy um, priorities, the key objectives of their national reform agendas. Let's uh, try not to get bogged down in political rhetoric. I think it's important uh, that we talk about some substantive action and where Latin America goes from here, I'm Becky Anderson, I'm the anchor of CNN International. I want to start with the president of Brazil, if I can. I want everybody to keep um, what they're saying to sort of three, three and a half minutes, if you will. don't really want to hear uh, statements from people. Um, I want to start, though, with the president of Brazil. If you will, what do you believe you th the region's main priorities are at this stage as we enter 2007. Well, first of all, I believe that there was a substantial change in Latin America for the better. I think that Latin America started to elect presidents that have, above all, responsibility and commitment to improve the living conditions of the American, Latin American people. It's very important to make this clear that there was a shift for the better in Latin America, although some may dislike the changes. And secondly, we have two definitions that I, we believe that will be decisive for the survival of Latin America and its political and economic growth. First of all, that we need to guarantee democracy fully because it's only with the strong de democracy that the poor sectors in Latin America will have the opportunity to progress, to see their economies grow, and then will have the opportunity to achieve full citizenry. Secondly, we have to consolidate our integration process. It's very important to stress that Latin America for many centuries had its political consciousness through the colonial times. Brazil was colonized by Portugal. Other Latin Americans were colonized by Spain and a little bit by England afterwards and then a little bit by the United States of America and now we're discovering for us to grow. It's necessary that we should believe in ourselves. We should uh, draft our own project. We should define our own agenda, our policies. We, be, we should act very seriously and at the same time we define that we need integration. We need political, economic and cultural integration in the region. We need trade integration and to uh, make integration building highways Ways, railroads, uh, bridges, uh, telecom, uh, energy, because this is what's going to establish the possibility for Latin America to grow as a whole. And we're doing that. We're working on this. We're, Brazil has been working together with other countries. The, the National Development Bank of Brazil has been financing projects in other countries, too, for example, the inter-ocean uh, highway from Brazil up to the port, Isdro, in Peru, 
a highway that comes from Brazil to Peru and will continue to finance other projects and more projects even and we want the support of the private sector because we want to build partnerships and I believe that the business community has to believe in the integration in the region. This is the road for Latin America, political integration, economic integration and trade integration above all physical integration and the strengthening of democracy. With this path we will be very well following this path. Thank you, President. President Calderon, what is your sense of the importance of the integration of Latin American economies today? Just for Latin America, not just for Latin America, but also other regions of the world are confronting a, a situation which is notoriously changing. It's changing in terms of technology, in terms of markets, it's changing in terms of information, it's changing in terms of climates. And the only way countries, particularly the Latin American countries, can cope with this new situation, this new changing situation, is by understanding our regional reality and precisely by establishing mechanisms for collaboration which will enable us to generate economies of scale and to maximize our potential, the potential of our region. I think it's possible that there may be a certain weariness in our countries uh, the, uh, after two or three decades of political reforms there is a certain tiredness because poverty is still there, there are environmental problems still there. Uh, when, uh, after all, when Moses led uh, his people in the Exodus, uh, they found themselves still in the desert. And, uh, uh, they still found themselves under the yoke of the pharaohs. So uh, perhaps it's not entirely dissimilar in Latin America. The discussion we're having today in Latin America, it's not a question of left or right. Rather, it's between the past and the future. Governments of the left, such as Lula, that of Lula, uh, are protecting markets which... Uh, which help us, and then there are conservative governments like the one in Colombia, which are working with uh, very intensive social problems. So the question is whether Latin America is capable, irrespective of the origin of governments, whether it's possible, whether it's capable of moving forward rather than retrogressing. Are we going to move towards uh, uh, democracy, or are we going to revert to personal, to personal type di di dictatorships? Is there going to be investment in our markets, or are we going to revert? Well, are we going to regress to past uh, practices of natu nationalization, which triggered some of the worst crises in Latin American history? And of course, in the future, uh, there is the subject of integration with one variation, not just regional integration. In Mexico, we are Latin Americans, in addition to belonging to the region of North America, with 78% of Mexicans regard themselves as, to be, as being more Latin American than the 8% that uh, regard themselves as being part of North America. But that doesn't exclude our integrating ourselves with other regions of the world. We can be multidirectional uh, and look to many regions of the world. We're going to, we're going to be uh, a link in the chain of uh, integration looking to North America and to the Pacific. So we wish to take on the, uh, the challenge of, glo of globality, of globalism. Thank you. José Miguel in Sulzi, your, your thoughts on what you've heard so far? Your thoughts on what you've heard so far? Well, I, I very much tend to agree with, uh, with what the presidents have said, in, and I would say in what, in what sense. I think that there is a change in Latin America today, and that change, if you look at the figures and the facts of this year, has been for the good. And the, Latin America is growing for its fourth consecutive year, and, that, and that's a, it should grow again next year according to our forecasts. And, it, uh, and that, of course, is uh, good news. Uh, for this, uh, this region had, had, didn't have that, 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 uh, that uh, thing, of, that, that growth uh, for the last 25 years. So if you compare it probably with other regions of the world, you say you still should grow more. But if you compare it with ourselves, with what happened after the crisis of the 80s, or in the crisis of the 80s, certainly it's a good development. Uh, of the 20 countries of Latin, of, South, of Latin America, 20 Latin American countries, 12 had elections to elect or re-elect their governments this year. 
and they were clean, competitive uh, elections with a lot of participation mm. and with real choices. Do you think they were all choice. clean? Do you really actually, think they were all I clean? Do. Actually, well, let me tell you, we observed most of those elections, and they were all clean. Of course, there's a problem when you lose by, by very few votes, it's harder to take. You suffer more than when you lose by a large majority. Uh, uh, no, I, I'm tempted to give you an example. When I was a student leader, I lost only one election. I lost it by two votes. That was terrible. <laughs> it was really terrible. You, you, you keep thinking that you should have got, got those two votes. But I think that there have been good, competitive, clean, participatory elections. And that's uh, the universe compared with what we had 20 years ago. And in, in social matters, which you have also very much discussed in the case of Latin America, the good news is that poor poverty has fallen in the last uh, two or three years, and the extreme poverty has fallen, the, the, the figure is still high, but has fallen from 98 million to 79 million. And that's a very good news from my point of view. So I, I think that we should pay attention to all these things. Of course, there are still problems. We are still not integrated enough to, to, to world economy. We still have to have, more, have clear rules of the game in every country. Uh, we still have to, to, to improve also internal markets because a, poor, a lot of poor people are not participating in the market. But the good, the good news about Latin America is that uh, it's doing well in the economy, in democracy, and in social problems. Also. All right. Um, I'm Belda. And your thoughts at this point? Well, uh, first thing, we've been in Latin America, Alcoa has been in Latin America for about 50 years. We have 25,000 employees in Mexico. We've got about 10,000 employees in Brazil. Um, we are continuing to grow. We're investing at the moment over $2.5 billion. We're managing over $2.5 billion of investment in Brazil. And we're in also investing in Mexico and bringing now more uh, value-added work there. So we believe on what's happening. The different, I mean, the tight races that you've seen as compared to the one we've seen in the United States recently, it's uh, not too <clears throat> different. Uh, I think Latin America, in, in our view, has made enormous progress institutionally. Uh, it is growing. It's got uh, one big challenge now, which is getting with minority parties, getting the mi microeconomy right, which requires a lot of work together, coordination, all the stakeholders together trying to change things that have been in place for a long time. Pres but I think they're doing very well in that, in that area. President Lula, then address um, that issue, the challenges that are faced by on a microeconomic uh, basis. I also want to know from you how a disruptive a force you think President Chavez is for Latin America and the sort of ideology that he pursues. Talk about, very briefly, if you will, your thoughts on economic sustainability, microeconomics, and then I want your thoughts on uh, President Chavez. Well, first of all, it's very difficult to talk about important issues in just uh, two minutes that you need us to speak on, so that's very difficult. I just wanted to say the following. First of all, the, rela the trade relation in Latin America has grown at an average of 30 percent a year from South America, maybe, and it has grown in a very substantial way. In all countries, with all countries, from Mexico to Patagonia, we have had that's an extraordinary success in our trade relations. Now, secondly, I believe that the political issue in Latin America is now being consolidated. Do not be concerned with, with speeches and rhetoric. Don't be afraid because even Morad is wants to nationalize the gas. He has entitled to nationalize the gas because it's his right. It's, he's the only wealth that he has. What Brazil has to do is pay a fair price for the gas that we buy from Bolivia. And in the same way, when the uh, raw material comes from Brazil, we want to sell it at a fair price for those that wish to buy Brazilian raw materials. Mexico will also not make concessions about its oil. Brazil will not make concessions on its oil. So it's necessary for us to have a little bit of caution when we analyze the speeches of people. The, the fact of the matter... Can I just stop you there for one second? That's Bolivia. I want your answer on the disruptive nature of Chavez, if you think it is or not. 
Não existe. It doesn't exist. No, this disrupting force. No, I believe first of all that President Chavez was elected three times in a consecutive in a row for the presidents of Venezuela, and all these three elections in the most democratic way, with the international observers following the elections. Then in the Brazilian case, the elections after 110 million voted in the last elections in two hours, we had already the results of 120 minutes because of the electronic ballots, because there was no complaint in the Brazilian elections in Brazil. Brazil, no candidate that won with 10,000 votes of difference had any complaints in the past election because we have the certainty and the guarantee of a democratic right is being exercised. And Chavez was elected every time in a democratic way. What people will have to learn is that each country has their own speech, their discourse according to the culture of that country, the reality of the country, their past history. And so what I'm saying to you is that we do believe firmly that Latin America experienced today a period of tranquility, of peace, and the Latin America will grow, South America will grow. We want that all these countries should come to the Mercosur bloc. Even Mexico have been invited to participate in the Mercosur bloc. We want to make a Mercosur bloc a major economic bloc to negotiate it strongly with the United States and to negotiate more strongly with the Asian countries, to negotiate more strongly with Europe. And so we're very, uh, we have good tranquility. The challenges that you face in order to impose some sort of economic stability, sustainable economic growth for a country that has had fairly erratic growth over the past few years. What are your biggest challenges? Well, the major challenge that we that need to make Brazil grow, first of all, is to have the consciousness that there's no magic in economics. In four years, we managed to do our homework with our economy. The economy is doing well. We have $87 billion in hot currents in foreign reserves. We have a trade surplus of $47 billion. We have surplus in current accounts. We pay the IMF our debt. We pay the Paris Club our foreign debt. So we managed to achieve our independence in the financial markets of the world. And now we have to be concerned only with ourselves. And so that's why we released a new economic problem of accelerated growth in the economy. Economy, that till the year 2010 we will invest $236 billion in infrastructure projects. Infrastructure uh, partially will be invested for housing and basic sanitation projects, more or less $130 billion. And the other part will be invested in, in electric energy, in highways, ports, airports, and high railroads. And, and I would like to invite all the business community here attending the World Economic Forum. If you want to make good investments in Brazil, try to go to Brazil now because you get great opportunities for investments. All right, good stuff. I want to go to the President of Mexico. Do you, do you want to pick up there or do you want... Please do. Please pick up. Oh, All right. You, 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 you have a, a wafer-thin uh, mandate, uh, sir. Um, the challenge of governability, it's been written, and I agree, is greater than ever in Mexico at present. We've heard where we think President Lula sees his challenges. What are yours? And I also want you to address the issue of whether you think President Chavez is a disruptive force. Well, I might have a better opinion. I think I, I don't like to judge people, persons, and I'd like to look at the situation of Mexico or, or in, in general, irrespective of the person of, of President Chavez. Uh, we uh, would like to have the same attitude to them as to all peoples of Latin America, Some, an attitude which goes beyond personalities. Latin America is united. The world is changing. The region is undergoing rapid transformation. The older part of Europe is undergoing transformation, Africa and Asia likewise. And so in Latin America, we mustn't lose any more time. We must lend uh, impetus to the transformation of our Latin American continent. At the same time, we have to do it in a more united manner. And without naming names, I think that uh, what we really need to do is to invoke the importance of, uh, of unity, of Latin American unity. And the more we talk about Latin American unity, the more tension we are generating among the countries of Latin America uh, without actually preventing that, uh, that union.
So Mexico is trying to be a link in the chain in various directions of the world, as I've said. So very happy to, uh, to join up with Mercosur and with, uh, with Brazil and President Lula. But it would be difficult to, 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 take, to put this in concrete form in terms of trade agreements. The challenges that face Mexico uh, we have to tackle, and there are three. First of all, there is the challenge of security, public security, security for our children, security for our families, and security for investors, uh, and legal security, of course. We want to have a country where the law is respected and where the government ensures there is respect for the law so that our investors don't have to fear public policies as perhaps they do in other countries. They are very welcome. Their money is very welcome. The investors are very welcome in Mexico, and they will be safe there. Uh, the second challenge we face is to create jobs, and we're absolutely clear that we can't do it alone. And, 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 and the third is combating poverty, expanding public policies that have been successful in uh, uh, under previous presidents at Sevilla and pre President Fox, strengthening human capital through education and the health system and transferring income to the poorest families to mitigate poverty. 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 Those are the three challenges. Combating poverty, uh, creating jobs and security. I would add a fourth there, and that is uh, attracting more capital inflows to increase the growth in the regional economy. Mr. Belder, how does Latin America do that? Increasing the capital inflows in the region in order to help those economies. Well, I, I think a lot of it has been done over the last 10 years. Uh, which is building the institutions and giving certainty. I think the macroeconomic uh, uh, actions followed by Zedillo and then Fox and, and now uh, by President Lula uh, are the kind of sayings that reduce the interest rate, that create an environment in which you can invest and think about in kind of companies like ours. We're thinking about 50 years down the road when we invest. We're thinking about education of people. We're thinking about local markets. And uh, one of the problems we've had sincerely in the last 20 years has been the lack of growth of the local markets. And I think this is an opportunity that's beginning to appear now, and uh, that's why we are investing more. Hmm? I want to just ask you, President uh, Lula, before we move on and come to you, uh, Mr. Ansouza, uh, you, in an effort to salvage global free trade deals, have said that you are prepared to make compromises. You've also said uh, that you expect and suggest that the US, the UK, France and Germany do the same. What sort of concessions uh, can you lay out for us today that you expect uh, from those uh, countries? And what are the um, concessions that you are willing to make? Well, first of all, Becky, you are not here as a moderator, you're here as a journalist, and so this is a typical journalist question, and that I would never be able to answer such a question. But let me say you some, something. Brazil has very clearly in its mind, and I just spoke with the Prime Minister Tony Blair now, and I just talked with Gordon Brown, Minister Honorable Minister Gordon Brown. I've been talking with President Bush, with President Chirac. I've been talking with uh, the, uh, the Chancellor from Germany, Angela Merkel, and I've been talking with everybody. We need that. Uh, we should have a spirit of maturity of statesmen and heads of government and to make a decision that the Doha Round Agreement is not an economic agreement, it's a political agreement. To, uh, we have to find out that if the developing countries and the rich countries are willing to do or make some concessions so that we can make it possible that the, the, the poorest countries would have an opportunity to have access to the European agricultural market, to have market access, and we have to have market access to Europe. It's, it's necessary to reduce the subsidies from the United States, and for that it's also necessary that the G20 countries, starting with Brazil, should also make concessions for the service industry and for the industrial sector. So we're willing to do our, whole, our part of the lesson, and, and we want the others to do their part. And I am convinced that there will be some moment in the next three, four months that we will reach 
Association Agreement of the Doha Round so that mainly the Latin American countries, the Caribbean countries, the poorest countries of this region and from Africa would have then the possibility to believe that in the 21st century they will not be treated anymore as a scourge of humanity but will be treated as sovereign countries, free countries, there's no, not colonial times, there's no uh, diamond or gold to exploit or in slavery so you have to generate jobs in these countries and for that you need productive investment. This is what we want that should happen from the Doha round. And I did ask that as a moderator. I wanted to get a sense of the region and the implications for the region of these trade talks. Mr. Souza, where, where do you think the critical policy decisions, shifts, patterns are for Latin America as we go forward? Well, I was saying that there has been a change in Latin America before. And many people say, we speak about populism and other things, which is something I want to address, because actually I don't think that in general nobody, anybody has been spending money that they don't have or making promises they can keep. Actually, as the President just said, there are no deficits, no fiscal deficits. There are, on the contrary, uh, balanced budgets, lower debts. The pay, debts have been paid to international institutions. What is different in Latin America today with regards to uh, 15 years ago is that after the crisis of 1980, a lot of people in Latin America and a lot of leaders in Latin America started uh, uh, preaching also something that came from, from other countries, which is this whole idea that the state was part of the problem and not part of the solution. That has changed. I think the state role is back in Latin America. I think that governments understand today that to deal with the enormous, especially with the enormous social problems of their peoples, you have to do something. And that's with some measures that are completely necessary, that are difficult to understand in other places or other regions, have to be taken. You were mentioning Bolivia, for example. Bolivia is not only the poorest country in South America. Bolivia is the, most, uh, the, the, the country in South America in which Income distribution is less fair in the whole region. I mean, in Uruguay, which is on the other side, the, other side, the, 20 the, the poorest 20% of the population takes home about 9% of national income. In Bolivia, where that 20% is much poorer than the one in Uruguay, they take home 2.2% of national income. So what are you going to do with that? I mean, you have to have a state that at least does something to redistribute wealth. If not, you're not going to have an internal market. You're not going to have a real labor force. You're going to have just a, a poor country with a very unfair distribution. So I think that the, the role of the state is back in Latin America. We shouldn't confuse that with populism, and we shouldn't just uh, condemn the need for governments to take measures, as the president said, to, to improve the condition of their people, which in some countries is really very bad. Right, okay, let's, let's put that to Ms. Bello. I want your business perspective on this, because if the role of the state is back, what is the implication then for the private sector? Well, uh, the, the, the difference is that you can privatize the management of the processes, but you still need the government to exercise policy. And part of the problem for the last 20 years has been a confusion between you have to privatize the means of production, you have to privatize the management, but the state did not take any position on the policy side. And the result is that you could not coordinate the different, different agencies to do anything that you needed to accomplish in the economy. As a result, you had too much uncertainty or you could not make any progress. So I think there's a role for the government, there's a role for private sector, we went one, too much one way, we're now back to the middle. President Lula? Well, I would like to thank uh, Alan Welder for his words, because one day came, emerged, suddenly someone smart in the world came out and said the state was worthless, that the markets per se would regulate all the mankind issues, and that was a lie. It didn't work out.
It didn't work out. Some countries thought that it was just transformed their currency in dollars and everything, the world would be saved. They went bankrupt. There's no magic for these things. The state, the government has a role to play. The state cannot make concessions in terms of the regulation powers that it has. What the state needs is to have a sufficient openness, judicial security in a sufficient way so that people can believe that making investments in that state and, and will have the possibility to have a return on their investments. At the same time, they will not be picked up in, by sudden measures or surprise measures that has happened many times in my own country in the past. In my country, the people would sleep with $10,000 in their bank account and they woke up with, with no money the next day because they changed economic plans and the currency. We don't cope with things with, through magic. We treat things very seriously. If there's any businessman or woman here that went to Brazil, Alan Bald is one of them. There's no, there's one thing that we enjoy very much. It's very serious in our relationship, and we want to believe in the goodwill on the private sector side, but we also want them to believe in us and what the government's going to do. This is the partnership that to look eye to eye, eye on the eye, and not to make concessions of the sovereign interests of the people and of the country that will make it possible for us to build a sound economy and that the private sector will have their own space and room and the government of the state will have its own room and space and everybody can live very happy because the truth of the matter is that if you want to know where there's where the state is very strong is in the United States of America or in Europe. That's the truth. Of the, that's the fact. Of the matter. There, the, there, the state has tremendous weight. The Doha round uh, doesn't reach an agreement because some countries don't want that to happen. It's not because of an economic problem. It's because of a political problem because the farmers have a weight in the elections, domestic elections in these countries. And so I believe that, Becky, you can be very cool and easy in your action as a journalist because Latin American is doing very well and we're going to even improve more and I can reassure you that we'll have another four years of my term others will be elected, re-elected, new ones will come and we're going to have a Latin American much more richer and much, much more social fairness I'm going to move this on to President Keller on your thoughts We have to understand there is an equation uh, which much of the world doesn't understand. Neither the state nor the market can, on their own, solve the problems facing humanity. It has to be understood that the market is a necessary condition to have a competitive and productive economy and efficient conditions of production and good services, but it is not a sufficient condition, necessary but not sufficient, to create real conditions for human development, uh, to create uh, an economy with a human face. And so if you want to strengthen the market, if you, want, you must also want to strengthen the state. It's Present, uh, its presence as a corrective in order to correct the inequalities which still exist in our Latin American countries, to correct the terrible responsibility that there existed in the past for the environment, uh, to guarantee conditions of security. If we get the equation wrong, if we consider that the state or the market in and of themselves are sufficient conditions, isolated for solving the problems of our peoples, that is when we make a mistake. The conceptions which fail in Latin America are those which don't grasp that important distinction. Um, what can we do in Latin America to advance more rapidly? What we have to achieve is to free ourselves from, from many prejudices which we have created in the past which prevent us from being properly understanding. Prejudices about the market prevent us from creating a region as competitive as others. Uh, we've all got natural resources, we've got, we've got human resources, human potential, and at the same time, when the prejudices have prevailed against the state, uh, we found a, a, deepening impover a deepening impoverishment or deepening poverty among our people. So it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. So the state's role uh, as it to correct imbalances and to correct unfairness is part of the key to development. All right, I want to come to you, Mr. De Souza. Are you concerned? Muito bem, eu quero continuar com o Sr. Souza. O senhor está preocupado com muitas. Directions that these governments are going. Effectively, many of the um, governments in this region don't have um, big majorities. They have, as I suggested in Mexico, wafer thin uh, mandates. Are you concerned about that? 
Well, yes, I am. I think that it's very important that in countries have stable majorities. I know that everybody shares that. The thing is that in countries that are in need of a big impulse for, uh, for, for development, we, we not only need democracy, we not only need, a, we need, we need healthy democracies in which majorities really rule, but also large degrees of consensus in society. I mean, countries that are doing well is those in which, despite of, of big difficulties, big problems, despite of a very strong political fighting... That's English. Bem, há um consenso básico no, da maneira como que os países... I think that that happens more than, I mean, that the, major, the, the political, major, the, the electoral majorities do not always show that consensus. I, I don't want to talk about, I wouldn't want to talk about countries, but I mean, President Calderón is here. I mean, I think that uh, nobody, there are very few in Mexico who would want to review the basic the features today of, of, of Mexican economy. Certainly, for example, not, the, not the, free trade, the free trade agreement with the U.S., which has been so, so important. I don't think that anybody wants really to, to throw it out. In Chile, I would say that political consensus was very basic in many of the, of the economic transformations that are taking place. So, yes, I think that in, in democracy we need majorities, we need strong majorities, and we need to form the largest consensus possible to carry, out, to carry on. Alan Belder, how concerned are you that these lack of legislative majorities will prevent the governments of Latin America pushing through the sort of social and economic reforms that individually and as a region they believe are needed in order that this region uh, be successful going forward? Well, you touched on one of the biggest challenges. The biggest challenge, both, both these countries have minority uh, parties. Uh, they are building uh, coalitions. There's no way to manage without building a coalition. I think the major uh, macroeconomic policies are in place. There's no revision of that. Nobody wants to go back. Uh, but the challenge is that two challenges. One is time. Uh, time, we need to do things faster. We have to catch up with the 20 years that we are behind while China was growing and Korea and others were growing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you can't review, uh, go back on, on the way the institutions are working today. And they have an origin. They have a reason to be the way they are. President Lula, I know, has uh, launched an effort of reviewing the political organization, the political pact in the country. That is necessary, but as necessary is some of the actions that he's putting forward to accelerate the development at this point in time. That will need consensus. That will need the parties getting together, but it will need also a lot of macro, microeconomic work, and, and that is the challenge. That's All right. That has been the biggest problem. Thank you for that. And if you've got something to say which is very short, let's take it. But otherwise, I would like to take uh, questions from the audience because, unfortunately, it is now uh, 20 past the hour, and I know that there will be many questions. Do you want to just respond at this point? Yes. Well, not as quickly as you requested, but first of all, I always admire in democracy, in the American democracy, that I admire that once in a while the Republican Party uh, would have made the president and, and the majority in the Congress was the Democrats, and then the Democrats would win the presidency and the Republicans were the majority voted the Congress. I don't think that the government had to have a majority in the legislative body will diminish the, or make the democracy decline. On the contrary, this will oblige that the government and the politics should exercise 24 hours a day and their democratic practices and to say that we'll try to consolidate our democratic behavior. I confess to all of you that I don't see this as an issue. I don't think that the National Congress is an issue. My concern actually is when you have a broad majority and then you think that things are easy and they're not easy even if you have a broad majority. I'd like to remember that in 1986 the party that was in power in those days elected 23 governors of the Federation and 320 uh, House representatives, they had f uh, full majority, and President Sarney faced a lot of problems to govern the country, we even with full majority. Uh, and so we have to know the following. Democracy is something extraordinary because we have to exercise democracy even when we're sleeping. And so this is what will consolidate the learning process in society and increases responsibility. And I confess to you that in Brazil, we are learning that. Thank you for that. Should we go to the audience at this stage? Can you raise your hand if you have questions? Uh, the uh, microphone is over here. Any questions from the audience at this stage? One question over there, sir. Please stand up, state your name, where you're from, and what your question is, and to whom. 
Yes, uh, Felipe Larraín, Catholic University of Chile. This is a question for President Lula. Uh, President Lula, you have uh, talked about Latin American integration as part of that trade integration. Uh, but yet one of the uh, goals that, that was set for uh, the Americas was the free trade agreement of the Americas, which is pretty much, uh, well, some people say dead. Uh, what will it take to uh, have a true integration in the Americas, and what would you be prepared to do to uh, you know, revitalize this process of integration, not just among Mercosur, but wider? Uh, well, first of all, the FTAA didn't happen because it didn't have to happen. What we want is to build an area of free trade for the Americas that, it, first of all, we can have the opportunity so that the poorest countries of the region can have the equals to leveling the playing field of the more developed countries. I'll give you an example. The European Union, when they established the idea of the European Union, when would they draft the bloc, Portugal, Greece, Spain, they received a lot of incentives. Uh, uh, West Germany spent billions of marks to absorb East Germany. So, if we developed the FTAA as it was thought in the beginning, the free treated area of the Americas, it was an agreement between the Brazil and the United States, actually. We want to reach an agreement with all the countries in South America and Latin America so that we can have the give an opportunity to everybody. And today, not even the United States is uh, complaining about the lack of FTAA. Because, first of all, we have to define the, the WTO rules of the game. Because it's the, if the WTO does not bring the results that society is demanding, that they should reach, what is going to happen is that we're going to go back only to the bilateral agreements between the nations, and this is not going to be good for the world. I would repeat again, this is not going to be a good thing for the world, bilateral treaties, uh, trade agreements. If we don't reach an agreement at the WTO, that makes it possible for us to define uh, the Doha round to help the poorest countries of the world. President Bush, President Prime Minister Tony Blair, President Lula, uh, the Chancellor Angela Merck, uh, President Chirac, and the G20 as a whole, uh, President Hu Jintao from China, everybody has to have the responsibility to act in this moment as statesmen. Uh, the issue is not an economic issue, it's a political issue, and we should convey hope to those countries that don't have hope anymore if in the world, for the people that don't know if they'll manage to wake up in the next morning and have something to eat. This is the challenge that we face, and we have to know if we're going to be statesmen or we're just going to be mediocre when we sign this agreement. Thank you for that. I am going to have to go for closing statements from everybody at this stage, I'm afraid, unless there's any really pressing question from the audience. Uh, President Calderon. Well, on the basis of the subject, I think it's vitally important for Latin America is to broaden the possibilities of investment in trade, not just for Latin America, not just for any one region, but for the whole of Latin America and this throughout the continent. The, the key is that we understand what, it, what trade opening means, what it means to better organize trade among countries. If it really does mean greater benefits for consumers, better prices for consumers, better quality uh, for people who have leased, and if it does mean better and more competitive inputs if it means increasing investment and employment. In the case of uh, Mexico with NAFTA, it's perfectly clear that uh, a large uh, majority of our investment is associated with NAFTA. And does it create jobs? Yes, 82 percent of jobs are associated with NAFTA. Could there be any – there are 42 percent on the average uh, 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 of NAFTA-associated salaries are better than in the rest of the country. So these are the real benefits of trade. This will enable countries to launch much broader, much more effective networks of trade. So what is the problem? I think it's our own prejudices again, our own preconceived notions which hamstring us. There are political reasons and there are political prejudices, ideological prejudices too, which override considerations of reason. That's the problem that we face now. It's not a question of majority. We've, we've got 42 percent in, uh, in the chamber. That's perfectly manageable. 
But I, th I think a substantive reform means convincing people in general, it means effective leadership so that people understand the benefits of reform, in this case reform of trade. If people don't know the benefits which could re result for their families, for their children, if we can't explain to our people which are the least developed countries, the less developed countries, which need, which have greater need, so that we can show where the clear winners would be, we're not going to make the progress we want to make. It's not just the tariffs, but it is also the barriers, the ideological barriers that have also got to be lowered. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, closing thoughts from our last two guests. Political prejudice is overriding reason. Your thoughts? Political prejudice overriding uh, reason when it comes to trade. And your thoughts as far as a closing remark well, is concerned? I, I don't think it's a matter of political prejudice. It's a matter of trade. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, there was some kind of a design into trade. Some countries did take it, others didn't. And at this moment, some, it, we have to do some different things. I, I don't think that there's going to be that what, what, what was called in 1998 the free trade agreement of the Americas is going to happen. That's a political fact. That's the way it's going to be. We have to look for different uh, uh, out, uh, ways out. And I think that, for example, many of the problems that the, that the FTA faced have to do with the same problems that the Doha round faced. Actually, uh, the problems, some of the basic problems that were, by the way, this problem of FTAA is not a problem or even on the present government. I mean, I, I, you know that there's a, there's a place in which this government should meet to discuss the FTAA, and they haven't met for the last 25 months. For the last 25 months, there has been not there has been, there has been even one meeting because there are no, there's nothing to discuss. And I think really that the FTAA is dead. And so we have to find different ways. And certainly we look at, look at, the, at the integration process that's going on in Latin America very well, and we're in a very, very good position. I only hope that they can be uh, strengthened as much as possible because from that, the, from that the, a certain uh, 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 approach can come. And I also hope that some problems, uh, you see, it's very difficult to ask some countries of, uh, of the region to go further in matters of free trade when such so, so relevant problems such as, in the, such as uh, agricultural subsidies, such as the problems of, in the, of uh, uh, industrial property are not... Uh, are not solved. And I, I really, I, I don't want to get into other subjects of this, of this, uh, of this uh, meeting. But uh, when, 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 they, when I put on the television this morning and say that there are very hectic discussions about how to carry out the Doha round, I ask myself, what are the concessions that are going to be made to bring the countries to, to bring the, the, the developing countries back on the table? Because if this only, I mean, without it, just, just to say one issue, there are not going to be any, there's no possibility of a country, for example, to mention one that's not, that's not here, such as Argentina, to accept uh, an agreement in Doha without some, in some concessions in matters of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of agricultural subsidies. So that it's, not, it's, not, it's not a, just a problem of political prejudice, it's also a problem of convenience. It's probably of what the really developing countries want to go into something that nobody denies. Free trade is a good thing, but it also has to be, uh, has to consider the, the, the circumstances and the problems and the degree of development of each country. All right, thank you for that. Alan Belder, your last thoughts. Well, uh, we went to Latin America 40 years, 50 years ago on the basis of the local markets. The local markets have sometimes developed, sometimes they haven't. Uh, I think the opportunity now has changed. The world is global, the integration is global, the, the synergies and the logistics are global. There's a different model out there. We need the opening. We need this to change and we need uh, politicians with courage to be statesmen in the world today. And, and that's what's going to change this picture. It's going to make us more competitive. It's going to make each one of these countries the plants we have in Latin America are between the most competitive we have in the world. So it's not about the people, it's not about the competitive nature of the plants, it is about integration in the world today and speed. We've got to do more, we've got to do it now. I can now thank you for that. And with that, I think uh, we will close this session. We thank you very much indeed.
all of you panellists for joining us and indeed the audience. And do remember, uh, just before you go, that uh, President Calderon will be... Uh, sorry? Do you want to... <laughs> Who's moderating this? Can, 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 can I just, that, just, just let everybody know that President Calderon will be speaking to Klaus Schwab after this. Before your closing remarks, sir, the floor is yours. I just wanted to say one last thing, because in the beginning of this discussion, there was a concern with democracy. Brazil believes so much, Brazil believes so much in its relations with the South American countries and Latin American countries. Brazil has so much trust in the fate of our neighboring countries that we are reaching an extraordinary agreement in the region. We are building a company between Petrobras, the state oil company in Brazil, with PDVSA, the state oil company in Venezuela. We're going to prospect for oil in Venezuela. In this joint venture in Venezuela, 60 percent will go to PDVSA and 40 percent will go to Petrobras, the Brazilian state oil company. We'll build a refinery in Brazil so that we, we can find 200,000 barrel day of heavy oil. And so in Brazil, we'll have 60 percent will go of the revenue of the investment of the profits will go for Brazil and 40% will the profits will go to Venezuela, 60% for Brazil. So we're starting to draft a project of a major gas pipeline that will link Venezuela to Argentina, going through our national territory and many other countries. And then we will have to reach an international treaty. And because we know, Chavez knows that, and I know that, that our dear Michel from Chile knows, Kishner knows too, Rafael Correa from Ecuador knows, Alain Garcia in Peru knows, everybody knows, Ivo Morales, Nicanor, Tabaré, everybody knows that there's only one opportunity for us is to strengthen the democracy in our continent and to make the country should not spend more than it can spend and to utilize this historical moment that we experience in Latin America without breaking our way with the major partners like the United States of America and the Europe, European Union, but to strengthen the relationship amongst us and from there onwards we will guarantee uh, Latin America for a better future and this is what I believe that I'm working for and that I work hard even more in my second term with much more experience now knowing, getting to know much better the people and the deficiency of my bureaucracy uh, and of the bureaucracy of the other countries so we're going to progress much more and I hope that you one day could make a good documentary about the consolidation of Latin America as a major continent in the world. Thank you. I promise that. I thank you very much, all of you, and you as well. Thank you.